So this is the last talk of today. Uh, and the last speaker is Gabriel Larotonda from uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires. And he will talk about an Estonian action of compact groups and their induced geometry. Thank you for your kind presentation, Francesco, and thank you for all the details of the organization that arrived in several emails with lots of helpful information. Okay, I will first want to really thank the organizers and uh, Barbara, of course, that uh, invited me, and I, I would let out Thomas, who is part of this uh, invitation, I think, uh, for their kind support. I'm really happy to be here. It's been a first uh, real meeting in almost two years, so it's really exciting. And uh, well, I will just start with my talk. As I were all there, this is joint work with uh, Martin Migliori, who was one of my PhD students back in Buenos Aires. And uh, um, I try to respect the, I wouldn't say order, but it came from Barbara, so it's more or less like an order that should be finite and infinite dimensional. So uh, I started, that I will start this talk by saying, wait, I should. This is what happens when you. By saying that uh, what we are interested in is in this uh, intrinsic um, B via distances in uh, compact connected semi semi simple Lie groups. Okay. Okay. And not any such distance because there's a lot of way to fabricate such distance, but uh, a, a distance that is produced by picking a complex polytope in a closed positive bijumper. Okay, so if this is kind of a mix of differential geometry and convex geometry. And uh, we already attacked the problem for uh, strictly convex or smooth norms, where there is a, this kind of uniqueness of geodesics, right? Like in the Hilbertian case. And then we wanted to understand better what happened when you have a, a unit ball of the geometry which has faces and it's not strictly complex. This happens a lot in operator theory. For instance, if you pick B of H and you take the uniform, the usual norm, you know this uh, sphere has faces, supporting faces. So the geometry is a little harder to describe in classical terms, right? Okay, this is what I do when I'm bored and try to do something more or less simple drawings. So here are, are two plays the role of our of compact group. Say everything's local and this is the flat torus. Okay. And uh, take the infinity norm, which is just maximum of the two coordinates. You know the sphere of this ball is just this square. So pick a point here in the pointer. I think it's this one. Oh. There, in the sphere, in the unit sphere, and everybody knows that if you compute the distance from this point to the origin, it'd be one by definition, right? Because it's in the border of the unit sphere. And everybody knows that if you want to find a short path between the real and P, it's clearly the segment, the most natural and uh, trivial path to choose, okay? So this is the formula. You know, it has speed equal to the uh, norm of P. So its length is equal to this distance. Okay, so this is what we call a geodesic in a metric set, right? It's a path which is maybe Lebesgue differential almost everywhere or rectifiable if you want, depending on the setting, that has length equal to the distance among endpoints. And what is the distance usually? Well, you have to take the intima over all paths joining given endpoints, just as you do in Riemannian geometry. But there is nothing Riemannian about this because the sphere is not brown, right? So the, this is more or less exchangeable names. Short means geodesic, geodesic means minimal. And I use it without taking much care for the audience, but keep in mind that these three words mean the same. It's a path with length equal to the distance above the end. Okay, so for this particular problem, confused, sorry, 
you, you said that the length is one, but then you said the length of the length would be the endpoint. Yes, but P has so not one. P. Sorry? P is in the unit sphere, so it has not one. So D is one, the small D? Yeah, D is. Ah, okay. I was stressing that the length is not equal to the distance. Okay, okay so D is one. D is one. Yeah. Oh, what is the length of the path? The length of the path depends on the setting, but in this setting, you can uh, differentiate if you have some derivative and then measure it with a norm. Any norm. It doesn't have to be smooth. It even can be what we call a Finster norm, which is only positively homogeneous, right? So that, that's, that would be the length of the path. There are more general definitions for metric spaces, but for this, it would, it would be enough, okay? So, as I say, the purpose of this research was to characterize all other short paths. And this, in this particular example, the solution is very simple. Probably it's most of you trip with this question at some point in geometry. You know, you should characterize the path by the following objects. You should first find a supporting face of the ball, which supports this point, right? And then it's important to draw what is called the cone generated by the face, which is that thing there. And then uh, if, you, if you want to find any other path, this one will do. This will be short. You can do the computations by hand, it's easy. This is, will also be short. And in fact, there is a folklore result, more or less easy to prove, that in any normal space, for any norm, it, it doesn't depend on its roundness or strictly convex or smoothness, if you got a path which is short, then its speed must be inside the supporting cone of the point, right? Is it clear, the statement? So you see these, these guys here can go with certain speed and then go down, but they never go much higher than this because the speed would be outside this, this cone, right? Now, if you pick, for instance, this point here, there will be lots of geodesic joining zero on this point, kind of a triangle here and here, and another triangle here and here. So all this area will be filled by short paths joining zero on this point, right? But as you move to the vertex, you see that the area is getting smaller and smaller. So you can easily prove that if you want to go from zero to the vertex of the sphere, there's only one short path which is the diagonal, okay? So this is very basic uh, normal geometry. So what are we intending to do? What we want to do is to-, to um, why, why can't I go uh, horizontal and vertical? Because it would be too long. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I mean, this is really easy to prove. You just do the computation, you need that. What is FP? Sorry? What is FP? If P is the face of the sphere supporting the point, and CFP is the cone generated by the space. Okay. Um, okay. So, what we wanted to do is to obtain some kind of nice characterization like this, but instead for a linear space with a norm, for a Lie group with a smooth differential norm. Right? One detail. As you see, the vertex here has only one smooth path. And it's also easy to see that if you have some ball with several extremal points, geodesics up to the point would be unique. So for a round ball or for a strictly convex ball, there's only one path going from the center to the outside, but that is a straight segment. There is no other one. Okay. So in particular, in Riemannian geometry, there's only one path. But as I say, this is far away from the manager. So this is our convex polytope. It will be sitting in the E algebra of the group. And with this, we will define a metric in the group, a distance in the group, using the traditional method of Riemannian geometry, which is the following. We start with an norm in a Lie algebra, but for this construction, we will need to be invariant by the adjoint action of K. This is very important for this construction. So, 
there's a nice characterization by Milner that says that this is only possible if the group is compact or maybe compact and the product of a vector space. Okay, the vector space part is irrelevant because everything is commutative and in that setting, there's not much interest in the geometry. And then uh, you define the length of the path as follows you compute the derivative and you move it to the origin by left or right translation. It's all the same because the norm is invariant for the action of the group. So these two numbers are in fact the same numbers. Okay. And once you have the length of path, you can define the distance, the radius, the integer of the length of paths, right? This is all very natural for those who study Riemann and George. The only difference is that the norm here is not a Riemann norm. Okay. So it's easy to see that by this property, this distance will be be varied. Okay. And uh, what is the geodesic in this setting? We have no order equations because we have no calculus of variations, right? Because we can derive derive the norm. But it's just a path that is short or minimizing for the distance. That is, its length is equal to the distance amongst its endpoints. That means you can, you should be able to find some path that gives you the minimum here instead of the increment. That's a geodesic. And there are several technical definitions. Something can be a local geodesic, but not a global geodesic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I will skip that part. I think I will concentrate on the local details that are easier to describe. Okay. So let's get back to our setting. We know how to characterize some short paths for this distance. And as in the case of uh, a linear space, uh, where the segment was always one possibility and distinguished geodesic, the one parameter groups are always short for this B invariant matrix, right? The condition was that you have to start with a norm which is invariant for the uh, 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 action of the group by adjoint, okay? This is a, a theory that has, that has some years now. It's valid, in fact, for any Banach Lee group. It doesn't depend on dimension. But as I showed in the in my very awful drawings, there could be many other paths, right? So can we give a nice characterization of all of them? Well, the main example here is start with a quadrant orbit in the Lie algebra and uh, take this polytone. Okay, to intersect the orbit with a closed positive bell chamber. That is um, a polytope. Um, and it's kind of a natural polytope to think of if you have a, an orbit. Okay? And generalizing this contract is construction. You will have a closed symplectic manifold and a Hamiltonian action that we will describe shortly. And take P as the momentum polytope of the action, right? Which is again. Uh, by G1 theorem uh, or by Boston theorem, right? them, always a polygon. Okay. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, these guys here in a, any compact Lie group with a, a metric constructed, as I showed you, is always a path of, of course, constant spin. But for any other path, its length would be greater or equal. So, corollary of this is these paths are these guys are good guys, they are our segments in the group. And as I mentioned, the problem we wanted to solve was give a good characterization of all other uh, short parts joining one the identity of the group and this guy here, A to the Z. So it's a capital Z, what is the type of? Oh, it's, it's a type. So it's, there is somebody in the other. Okay, I will go uh, through the main theorem because it's not the, I don't think it's the main interest of the talk, but it's relevant for our talk. So it's always possible to reparameterize paths by constant speed. You know, if you've done a basic cursor, curves, in surfaces by 
feeding the carbon or something like that. You know, you can reparameterize by arc length or by uh, constant length. But in this case, we, re we reparameterize the logarithmic derivative instead of the usual derivative. Right? This is also same computation as in the class instance. You can do it. So this is for simplifying the statement of the theory. And in this case, if you start with a short path, then you obtain a, a necessary condition is that the logarithmic derivative must stay inside the face of the ball of the invariant norm. Right? So the logarithmic derivative of gamma cannot leave a face. So this is a necessary condition to be true. Exactly the same condition as if it was a linear space. Right? Oh, you can describe the the phases by supporting functions, it's a nice theory of convex objects, etc. Never mind that. Um, and conversely, if you have a, a path which has a logarithmic derivative inside a phase and it's not too long, this is because you don't want to go around several times around the torus, for instance, you have to keep it short, then the path will be short. Again, same so it's an if and only if, but you have to be careful not to go around the sphere. What is five? Sorry, what is five? Five. Uh, we usually describe the phases of a polytope by supporting hyperplanes. So five is a norm one um, functional in the dual, and this hyperplane here is an affine hyperplane. We should obtain by taking the pre image of the number L by this um, linear function alpha, right? Okay, now we start with the main construction. We start with a compact full alt invariant set. Full means that absorbs rays, so if you move it around, you can generate the whole space, okay? And the definition of generalized Hopper norm is as follows, which seems kind of unnatural, but it looks like you're trying to compute the diameter of the object, right? And if you do some uh, computation by hand, you see that it's the same to take E or take the convex whole of E. Okay. Okay, and for the moment, this seems a bit unnatural, but then we will connect it with something else. Now, fix the Cartan sub algebra of the E algebra of the group. That W be the by group, and you have to choose a, a, a set of a simple positive roots, which is called uh, close positive by channel. And we are assuming that here E is some set, then we will see that it happened in our examples is a finite set. And you can take the this, this here means you have to balance the object. Because maybe it's not balanced around zero, right? So you first take the differences of uh, things there to have a balanced object, take the complex full, and you cut it with the Cartan algebra. This is what we call Hoffer's polytope. And if you take the polar dual of this guy, this uh, will be the uniball for this norm. Okay, these are very straightforward computations from complex analysis. So the idea is. Never mind this formula. You have a complex body, you move it around, or I mean, you have a, a, an invariant body, you move it around, you make it complex, and you want to get a formula for the Minkowski functional of that body, and that's the formula. It's nothing like that, nothing mysterious, and very natural. You can go both ways. I mean, you can start with this formula and find the body, or you can start with the body and obtain the formula. And in fact, it's not easy, it's not hard to check that if you cut this ball with the Cartan sub algebra, then you obtain the polar dual of the form. So there will be a, a good relationship between uh, P and this dual and properties of geodesic, etc. Well, now this part is a bit technical, so I will go um, slowly. I don't think it's very relevant for the exposition, but it, it, I think it would be good. To make the connection of these uh, finite dimensional definitions 
with the geometry of an infinite, infinite dimensional linear. Okay, so start with the symplectic manifold. I'm assuming here that M is finite dimensional, but I'm not sure we haven't done much work to generate situations. Uh, we assume it is compact and closed, so that means it has no border. Right? So for any function that maybe depend on the parameter t, you can fabricate your uh, symplectic vector field by using the duality of the um, symplectic formula. This is a classical formula to recover the vector field from the Hamiltonian. And then um, we consider this group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, which is in fact a Frechetti group. Uh, it's defined, it's kind of weird because it's a subgroup of the symplectic diffeomorphism, but it's much smaller in the following sense. You only consider symplectic diffeomorphisms that can be reached with an isotopy starting from the identity and ending at this guy. And this isotopy, of course, is prescribed by Hamilton's equation or some Hamiltonian vector field. Okay. So the, the only guys living here are the endpoints of this path, solving one of these equations for some Hamiltonian function. The Hamiltonian is called autonomous when it does not depend on T. Okay. That's okay. And Helmut Hofer introduced in the 90s this norm in the D algebra of this infinite dimensional group that can be easily identified with the, the quotient of the function on M. And you have to divide by R. This is an artifact of this definition. As you see, if you change the function with a, you add the constant to the function, it defines the same Hamiltonian vector field. So that's the ambiguity, and that's why you have to divide here by R. Okay. And this is Hoffer's norm in the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So you see things start to begin or begin to, to look like the formulas we had in the previous slides, the maximum of function minus the minimum of power function, right? Okay, yeah. Did you, have you uh, become autonomous in the last ones? Uh, no, no, you can, I mean, you can put a T in, just either put, can be autonomous or not autonomous. This is a very interesting uh, definition of dimensional group. It, it is smaller, as you see, because as the, there was a lot of talks about groups in field today, and usually they define the algebra with the vector fields, right? And the, the vector fields on the manifold. It's kind of you have to choose n functions. Now you have to choose only one function. So it's kind of infinite dimensional, but smaller. Okay, and Banyaga proved that it's, it's fact, it, this is a simple group. So that's, no normal groups. Okay, now I have to discuss this definition that for some people is natural, but for me it's not so. So, what is a Hamiltonian action of a compact group? Okay, so first you need an action, obviously, but then you have to ask more things the notation for the action would be this. And uh, the easy way to say it is that if you fix k, you have a diffeomorphism. Of the manifold, you want that to be a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. That's the easy way to say it. But in, in terms of computations, there's a more useful formula that there is equivalent to having a momentum map. Okay, so this is, this is a map intertwining the geometry of M and the geometry of K. It's a map from M to the dual of K that fulfills this formula. And here, a couple of details. You have a small s in the algebra, right? And you produce a vector field in the manifold as follows. You uh, construct the one parameter group in the compact group, this, this guy here, the little guy. You push it to the group of diffeomorphisms with the action, and then you differentiate the two. So you have a, some certain mapping from the algebra of the group to the uh, vector, Hamiltonian vector fields. Okay, what we are asking here, this is a hypothesis, maybe it can be relaxed, is that the action would be almost effective. That means the kernel is discrete or equivalency that at the D algebra level is injective. So this, this map here will be injective. So the X to this guy would be injective. 
since this value is injected, we can pull back of course let right? And if you do that, what you have is exactly this formula, where the set now is the image of the momentum. I think this is only kind of trivial, but also very nice how the pieces are put together. So uh, what I mean is that we have this general theorem about the invariant metrics, but we needed examples. And we run out of examples in B of H. Uh, we used the shattered norms, spectral norms, when we went to von Neumann algebra, but then we started to look at groups of the machines, and, and this is a nice setting to apply our theorem. Okay, the bad thing is that our theorem does not apply directly to the group of uh, Hamiltonian behavior business because our technique involves lifting of paths from the group to the algebra. And in a Banerjee group, you can do that with exponential. But the exponential for these fresh and groups, you know, is very not well behaved. It cannot be, maybe it's not subjective, maybe it's not injective, lots of trouble. But since it, this is a metric problem, possibly there's a kind of Way of attacking the problem by approximating. Okay. But for now, we are dealing with a compact big group, which has full parties. Okay. This there is a classic theorem by Key ones that says that in fact, this intersection of the momentum map with this, you, you, you have to choose the Cartan algebra, you can choose whatever you want. They are conjugated because this is a Compact semi simple Lie group is kind of the simplest Lie group you would imagine. Right? And then this plus here means you have then a pick uh, the simple positive groups to represent the system to avoid random noise. This is in a complex polygon. Right? This is always a complex polygon. And this, this is what we call the momentum polygon of the action. Okay? Now, in particular case, which we found most interesting is uh, the symplectic manifold is just a quadrant orbit, right? And via the Keeling form, when we identify these two guys here, because the Keeling form is non degenerating now set. Of course, you can do duality, et cetera, but everything is much more simple if we do the identification. And you have the natural symplectic form here, which has this nice formula. <clears throat> And you have a canonical action, obviously, uh, by quite joint action. So, sorry, somebody wanted to add something. Oh, I missed her. This action is Hamiltonian. This is easy to prove by hand. And the momentum map is just inclusion. So it's the most simplest scenario you can think of of the general setting. And these guys, this, uh, you, you have an element of the group, you push it to the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism and is this really simple diffeomorphism. This is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Yeah. I mean, if you need an example for computations, you can start with this always, or all my math. Example. So remember, for uh, x an element in the Lie algebra of the group, you can push it to a vector field in the manifold, specific vector field, and in this case, the vector field is just bracketing. And this orbit norm, which has this computation again and again, and the unit ball for this norm will be the, the polar dual of this convex capsule of the orbit. This is really easy to see. So we want to characterize your lessons. You remember, we have this theorem. Some path is a geodesic short in the group. If and only if the logarithmic derivative stays inside the face of this ball. So the question is, what are the phases of this theory ball? Right? If you can characterize them, you can characterize all geodesics. Okay. The first example that I think is also but but your geodesics have nothing to do with geodesics of the killing metric or something. No, nothing. No, my, I, we, I, we are using the geodesic world in the sense of normal or of inner metric spaces, where it's just the path. You, you can measure its length in some way, and its length is equal to the distance among the elements. 
That's the, our meaning of students. So you take a zero trace skewermetric matrix. It should have different eigenvalues. Why is that? Because you want the convex body to be full. You want the norm to be non-degenerate. If you have some repeated eigenvalues, then the body will be uh, of co-dimension or positive co-dimensional and won't define a norm, just a semi-norm, right? That's, that's why the formula is quite clear. This is the same formula once and again and again and again, but with different letters. And by some characterizations that are essentially due to Yoti, you can describe very easily the phases as you have this classical result. And I think they, it was also known before then, but they, they took the, the job to write it down neatly. Uh, you fix the diagonals of algebra, so essentially fix the basis, and choose all the skewermetric metrics that, that be written in this diagonal way, right? So if, if you think of matrices, it would be all the matrices were right? diagonal in a fixed basis. Okay. But now the condition to be in a bi chamber is to have all the values in a fixed form. That's one way chamber. Another way chamber is you permute work two of them. And another way chamber, okay, because so you obtain all way chambers by permuting this order. But essentially they are all the same. You have to have the same order. So as long as you move the matrix, but the order of the values are not changed, they, know, they are not interlacing, let's say, uh, they will be staying in this by jump. The face is just the intersection with the, this is the linear function, that's a plus. Yeah, never mind this formula, what we use. And so by the previous characterizations, you have that the path is short, it's an only if and only if, but the interesting part is this one. The Lorentz derivative is what does it mean that it commutes? I mean, for any T and S, this matrix will commute. If you have this matrix T and this matrix S, it will commute. And moreover, the eigenvalues of all these guys for all T will not be interlacing, but we keep in the same order. Okay, so that, that's a very nice, very nice precise description of. If you want to go from point A to B, choose any path that does, does not exchange the value values. Okay. I don't know, maybe it's anecdotic, but we find this kind of interesting. Okay, get, we'll get back to the to the general situation. Um, the compact semi simple groups, but not so general because we're still talking about orbits. Uh, again, we're dealing with regular orbits, and it's again all the like values are different, so we don't have a semi norm by the norm. And then we could prove that the path is short if I'm on the it's slow derivative, is contained in a wild channel. Okay. And this is what happened in the previous results because it's the most description of the wild chambers of the theory. Okay. But this is holds for any compact semi simple And now, as a small comment, it may happen that for a singular orbit, at least there are some repeated eigenvalues of the, of, uh, okay, the matrix you are orbiting. It may happen that they have the same complex caption. This, this can happen. You can think of examples in three by three matrices. This is easy to do. But uh, since they have the same polytope, the geometry will be the same. So the theorem also applies. And here's a nice characterization on when this happens. So suppose you start with the orbit of sigma and you want to know if the only points of here are regular, then you will have to check that this, this is kind of a mean of sigma with this guy, it has all different values. W star is the, the only element in the value group that exchanges the well chamber with the opposite of chamber. Okay, this is again an if and only. So you can start with any orbit and ask yourself uh, if the theorem will be valid. The only bad thing that is probably you will get a seminar. Who cares? 
And uh, to kind of wrap it up, well, maybe not wrap it up, let's remember a couple of definitions. This was the definition of the coffers polytope for the area for any action now, a close manifold, close manifold. The ball was just a polar dual. And uh, we wanted to know when this phenomena happened, like in SUN, you know, when, when are these phases abelian? So we could characterize it, and it's, it turns out that it's equivalent that the, all the extreme points of the Hoffer polytope are regular points. Regular is the algebra sense that all the values of the adjoint operator at this stage. Okay. Okay, and as kind of a corollary of this, we return to the something that has to do with my awful drawings at the beginning of the talk. If all the three points of the Hopper portals are regular, then by the previous theorem, uh, well, you leave locally the path to a path in the, in the tangent space, in the Lie algebra, you can always do that locally, of course. But then these guys will have to commute because these. With commute. I mean, if you take the log I mean, there, but it, it's easy to see that the exponent also commutes. And then it's easy to see that, in fact, uh, the lifted map behind the exponential is now a short path in a normal space. So, in this case, when all extreme points appear regular, geodesics are characterized like this. You pull them up to the tangent space, and you see if they are geodesics of the linear space. And that's an if and leave. So you reduce the problem of studying geodesics in the group to the problem of studying geodesics of an open space, which we know are characterized for having the speed gamma prima contained in the cone, in the cone generated by the ferrous, the phase that supports what? Supports the endpoint, because that's the endpoint of the row. Gamma to one. Right? Okay. Now, um, there's a nice correspondence, which in fact kind of gave, gave us the motivation to, to apply our result to this group, which is the following. You have this correspondence, you have stuck with a smooth path in K, and you push it to the diffeomorphisms of M, assuming that the, the action is Hamiltonian, this uh, guy is an isotope, right? So it will be a path in the um, group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, this guy. Okay, what happens with you start with a short path here with a pullback metric? Well, of course, it will be pushed into a short path for the Hopper metric. And it's in, 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 in if and only if. This is only natural, and of course, it's trivial if this was a Riemannian geometry. Because pullback metrics behave really well. Geodesics are the same on both sides. You just push them back and pull them forward. It's the other way around. You pull them back. Okay, but this is uh, has a completely different approach and group because there's nothing reminding about it again. Um, now remember this isotopies have to comply with this Hamilton's equation, right? And what is interesting is that you can distinguish between the lines, which are the one parameter groups, and the other twisted geodesics. So lines are going to autonomous Hamiltonians. And that's it's an only if and only if. Okay. When you do this construction, you start with a path here, you push it to the isotopy using the action. If you start with a one parameter group, which is our Generalization of the line, then you will have a autonomous Hamiltonian, no dependence of. Speed. And what happens with all the other short paths? Well, they go to what Hoffer called the quasi autonomous Hamiltonians, which are uh, Hamiltonians that are depending on T, but they all attain their maximum at a fixed point for T and the minimum at a fixed point for T. So that's, that's a, that gives you the big picture of the correspondence. Okay. Well, that's all I have to say about that. And thank you very much.
Thank you for your talk. So we have plenty of time for questions and discussions. Um, so you're you're primarily concerned about the non-Riemannian case, is that correct? Or well, for this theorem, uh, the Riemannian case is really easy to solve because the, the unique the geodesics are the one-parameter groups. That's a classical example. I think this all came from the study of the geometry of the unitary group of a Hilbert space with the supremum norm. That is non Riemannian. So yeah, you are mostly now interested in the non reminder metrics. So can you do it um, for, I don't know, infinite dimensional the algebra of compact type? We don't know, but we are, we, we already began studying this. There are several technical difficulties as, because, as I mentioned, uh, our theorem for proving the. I mean, at some point, uh, all the constructions need first to begin with the idea that you have the distinguished class of geodesics, which in this case are the one parameter groups. And, and to prove this, uh, at least in our proof, we use the, that the exponential map is local homomorphism. So for Banachli groups, it's okay, but for Fresheli groups, it's, it's not. But as I said, we have there are certainly to um, use these ideas of, of taking inductive limits and approaching the, the things with smaller objects where the theorem is still valid. Because uh, at the end, we only want an inequality to hold. So if it calls for all n, then it will hold at the end of the road. But we don't know really how to. Do the correct approximation. I mean, it's you have to approximate the topology of the Fechet topology with uh, something that preserves your know, inequalities. No questions? Anything online? Let me just ask what's in the next slide. <laughs> ah, okay. I think we all deserve a beer. Yes. <laughs> okay. If there are no further comments, then we thank Gabriel again.